on Friday, July the 26th, 2019, 7.07 p.m., which, which agrees with the calendar, or in the Hijri calendar, the 23rd of the Qi'dah, the year 1440 after the Hijrah of Mustafa, alayhi salatu wassalam, which is about approximately six days left of the Qi'dah. Then after that starts the month of the Hijjah, in which is a performed another pillar of our religion, which is Al Hajj. As we continue Kitab al Tawheed, we arrive to the chapter which says, Babun ma jaa fi himayat al Mustafa, Janab al Tawheed, was said dihi kulla tariq. Oh, we actually didn't understand that. Was said the tariq, was said dihi kulla tariq in yusilu il shirk. The chapter which comes in. The protection of Mustafa, meaning the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, the door of the. How do they translate your books, by everyone? Give it to the new chapter. You don't have the right chapter? Let me see, I can't see it. No, we actually finished up. Here it is, right here. What's that? Chapter 22. Uh, protection. Closing area. No. That's it. Chapter 22. Right. The chapter which comes in the protection of Mustafa, the affair of monotheism, and him closing off every door that leads to polytheism. <coughs> Actually, we stuff it all over to be there. I'm sorry, everyone. I skipped something. Go back a chapter. I'm s- I apologize, everyone. That's my mistake. My mistake. Everybody turn back. The chapter before that, which is, I'm sorry, I don't know why my, my mind skipped to the other part. The chapter which comes in that, أَنَّ الْغُلُوْ فِي قُبُرِ الصَّالِحِينَ يُسَيُّلُهَا أَوْثَانًا The chapter which comes in that extremism in regards to the, the graves of the righteous will make it idols of worship. يُسَيُّلُهَا أَوْثَانًا Forgive me everyone, I don't know why my mind turned to that directly, I apologize. We were discussing in the chapter It's like you find that every single chapter we've been covering are all connected They are all connected And you'll find that this book, as we discuss Clarifies to everyone the meaning of monotheism And all the different types which is connected to the foundation of the religion and the origin of mankind of why he was created or for the purpose of why he was created. You'll find that the great Imam, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, authored this book in order to clarify to the people how to worship Allah properly. And what is monotheism? And what is the worship, unification of Allah and his worship? And he also clarifies in detail, which opposes the reason of why the creation was brought into this existence, what negates that, which is polytheism. And he gives in depth, explained detail in this regard, which you'll find that a lot of Muslims these days are heedless of or unaware of, either due to lack of knowledge or either due to laziness or, neglect or negligence or evil scholars that have misled them, teaching them that polytheism is Tawheed and Tawheed is polytheism, and they switched it. Or you'll find that it's based upon what people want to do because of what their forefathers were practicing, and they just follow them out of what they call a taqlid al-a'ma al-muharram. Blind follow them out of, just blind follow them, blind following them, in a manner which is impermissible in the religion of Islam, which is called a taqlid al-muharram. Is that we know that taqlid is of different types, but the taqlid that you'll find that a lot of people practice is the taqlid al-a'ma al-muharram, the impermissible taqlid, meaning that which has no evidence and proof to substantiate it. So you'll find, Ya Ma'ash al ikhla as we were discussing in this chapter as we started, we said that the chapter, which if you look in your books, it said, "Babu ma jaa an al ghulu fi qubur al salihin yusayyiluha awthanan tu'abdu min dunillah." 
the chapter which comes at extremism in regards to the graves of the righteous, that it will make it idols of worship, which will be worshipped besides Allah. It will be worshipped besides Allah. So, <clears throat> this is another reason of why the people fell into polytheism, whether it be in the past or whether it be during the times of the prophets. And likewise, this is the same exact, if you want to say for lack of better words, the same exact rabbit hole that the people of these days falling into or going down that same rabbit hole or that same track of shaitan, which came as a result of it, they fell into polytheism, whether they perceive it or whether they do perceive it, but they're just doing it out of blind following of doing what their forefathers used to practice. So we said, Ya Ma'ash al this is another reason you'll find of why the people fell into polytheism of today due to extremism, ghulu, in regards to the righteous, or the graves of the righteous, until, like we said, they became idols of worship besides Allah. <clears throat> as we discussed before, as we were discussing about the most evil of deviant sects of the past, As we said, the, what, the group had opened this door of polytheism to the people. As the most evil of deviant sects from the Muslims, as we said, were two, of which you will find that the great Imam, he said and explained, which are still the test for the Muslims of these days. As the most evil of the deviant sects in the aspect of ibadah is the Ruafid and the Shia, as we discussed. As the Ruafid and the Shia, are they are the most sharr tawa'if fi ba'd al-ibadah hum al-shi'a wa al-rawafid sarahtullah sharr tawa'if fi ba'd al-ibadah hum al-rawafid wa al-shi'a wa wa sharr tawa'if fi ba'd al-asma' wa al-sifat hum al-jahmiyah as we said the most evil and deviant sects in regards to worship of Allah is the rawafid and the shi'a and the most evil of the deviant sects in regards to the affairs of al-asma' wa al-sifat affirming the beautiful names and lofty attributes of Allah is the Jahmiyyah. As they were called the Rawafid or the Rafida, Ya Ma'ash al ikhwa due to the fact that they rejected Zayd ibn Ali, ibn Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why are they called the Rawafid? They're called the Rawafid or the Rafida. They're called the Rafida due to them rejecting the call of Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein. Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who's probably want to say the great great grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Radiallahu anhu Allah. When the Shia and the Rawafid, of course we know, they cursed Abu Bakr ibn Umar and they called them Sanamai or Sanama al Nar, Abu Bakr ibn Umar. And they have a dua called, عندهم دعاء يسمى دعاء الصنمين يلعنون أبا بكر عمر وبنتيهما حفصة وعائشة رضي الله عنهما وإن كانوا يصرحون بحبهما وفاكا عندهم التقية التي تبرل, تبرل لهم الكذب فيظهرون المحبة لآل البيت بينما تجد في الداخل يبغضونهم ويلعنون أبا بكر عمر وَزِيَرَاءَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَبَنَتَيْهِمَا وَيُسَمُّونَ هَذَا الدُّعَاءَ دُعَاءَ الصَّنَمَيْنِ يُفَانِ يَا مَعْشَرُ الْإِخْوَةِ that they call the Rawafid because they rejected the da'wah of Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib when they tested him and asked him what is your position in regards to Abu Bakr Umar and Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali he mentioned it said هُمَا وَزِيَرَاءَ جَدِّي they are the two administers Meaning they were the two great companions of the, uh, my, my, grand, my grandfather. He's talking about the Prophet And he was also talking about, he was also speaking about who everyone. He was also talking about his father Ali. As they were also his companions and they were also those who ate it. And they were all together at one time. So he said, Huma jaddi. When the Shia heard this from Zayd ibn, Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein, they rejected this. They rejected, which is a direct meaning of the word rafud in Arabic language. Rafadad, which means to reject or refuse or to deny. Yani rafadu da'wa. And I rejected the invitation. 
ارسل الي دعوه فرفضتها there was an invitation or invite that came to me and i rejected it رفضتها i rejected it as the word رفض in the arabic language as we know linguistically means to reject to reject to not accept to the end of it so that claim of theirs of, of rejecting what Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein said to them as a result of it they were called the Ruafid they were called the Ruafid the majority of the deviant sects in the religion of Al-Islam they were called the Ruafid uh, yeah, you should have a أنا حسبت أنك ربما هناك إشكال فلا تزيل هذا اللبس عنك الله يحفظه وإياكم حيكم الله وإياك طيب so they rejected the da'wah of Zayd ibn Ali and we said يا معش الإخوة you'll find that when he praised them they rejected this claim when he praised Abu Bakr and Umar who are the best of this nation after the message of Allah and as we know the best of this nation after the message of Allah was Abu Bakr and Umar who the Ruafid curse who they curse. As you know, they skip past them and jump directly to Ali, as they say. But at any rate, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwa, the reason why the Ru'afid was called this is because of their rejection, they claim of accepting what Zayd ibn Ali mentioned in it. As you know, that this deviant sect of the Ru'afid was started by a Jew, it was started by a Yahudi. You'll find that the Ru'afid. If not, the majority of the deviant sects in Islam were started by non-Muslims. You'll find that the majority of the deviant sects, if not all of them, were started by non-Muslims. For example, the Ruafid was started by Abdullah ibn Saba, al-Yahudi. Mu'assis hadir al-firqa huwa Abdullah ibn Saba, al-Yahudi. Abdullah ibn Saba, al-Yahudi. You'll find that the majority of the deviant sects all started with a non-Muslim. Started with a non-Muslim or the non-Muslim had some involvement in starting it. Even the Khawarij. The Khawarij originally was started by, by the Khuaysir al-Tamimi, no doubt. But those who started the Fitan and who played a, a, a tremendous role in spreading it was Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi. Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi who also had an involvement in or stirring up the people against Uthman and Ali until they were killed unjustly. And he played a major role in it. So also he was a non-Muslim who played the role in what? Of starting the most dangerous of the deviant sects in Islam. Which you'll find that Shaykh al-Islam mentioned, it says, and we're going to mention what he mentioned, mentioned about them in a minute, inshallah. طيب. As you'll find that Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi, he was the one that started the deviant sect, the Rawafid. And they're the most dangerous sect upon the Muslims to this day. The Khawarij and who else? The Shia, the Rawafid. To this day, they are the most dangerous of the, of the deviant sects of the Muslims. And they are the most dangerous probably of the countries in the world today. And if I'm not mistaken, they still have their missiles pointed at Mecca right now. They have their missiles pointed directly at Mecca right now. And there was attempts in order to shoot missiles and bombs at Mecca approximately two years ago, in which one of the missiles were intercepted, and the missile was aimed, to, aimed directly at Mecca. So how can you think that a people who want to destroy the most sacred land, if not the most sacred, holiest land in the world, the most sacred, holiest land in the world, which is considered the love city of Mecca, in which Allah Ta'ala had talked about its sharaf, its high status, and you have a people out there that wants to shoot a missile at it and destroy it, which shows you the despicable filth that they're upon. And how can anyone will even think to even join them and bring them close? And this is, this is you'll find that Jama'at al-Ikhwan al-Mujrimin, that they also show loyalty to, loyalty to them. And even though they're the most despicable and evil of the deviant sects, as we talked about, if you look to this deviant sect, it was started by a non-Muslim. It was started by a non-Muslim. Likewise, similar to that, you'll find that the Ruafid was started by, yeah, excuse me, everyone, I'm sorry. The Khawarij was also started by Abdullah ibn Saba, who had played a tremendous role in allowing its fitna, it the fire of that particular trial and tribulation in regards to the killing of Uthman Ali. Abdullah ibn Saba was also involved. Also in regards to the deviant sect 
who is the most evil of deviant sects in regards to al-asma wa sifat, to the name and lofty attributes of Allah, who is the Jahmiyyah, was also started by a non-Muslim. The Jahmiyyah was also started by a non-Muslim. And its ideologies and its fundamentals also started from non-Muslim ideologies. Jofan, for example, the originator of the one who started the Jahmiyyah, or who everyone, it was not Jahmud al-Safwan, it was who came before him, which Ja'd ibn Dirham. Ja'd ibn Dirham. Ja'd ibn Dirham, who's the one that originated the deviant sect of the Jahmiyyah. The Jahmiyyah that is not, as we know, start, uh, the one who made it famous was Jahmud al-Safwan. Jahmud ibn Safwan started and took his ideologies from Ja'd ibn Dirham. Ja'd ibn Dirham, as we know, took his ideologies from Aban ibn Sam'an. Aban ibn Sam'an. And Aban ibn Sam'an took his ideologies from Talut. Talut. And Talut took his ideologies from Labid ibn al-A'sam al-Yahudi, al-Ladhi sahara al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the deviant sects of the, of the Jahmiyyah returns back to a Jew also. The deviant sects of the Jahmiyyah returns back to another Jew. A Jew who was accused of doing magic to the, upon the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. So the Jahmiyyah, so the, the Ruafid was started by a Jew, and also the Jahmiyyah was started by a who? By a Jew. You'll find that the Jah, who are the most evil of sects, and they're the most evil of sects to today, they are the most two deviant sects that still have the most influence upon the Muslims of today, to this day. As far as the Jama'at al-Ikhwan al-Mujrimeen, they are just what they call mujamir. They just gather everyone together, that's all. They just gather everyone together, that's all they do. No matter what they're upon. The most evil of deviant sects again, is in Islam and the most grateful of harms of all the deviant sects that bring the most harmful Harmful, reprehensible manner, matters is, like we said, the Rawafid and the Shia. Uh, excuse me, the Jahmiyyah and the Rawafid. Who are the Shia? Taib. We said that both of them were started by a Jew. One was Abdullah ibn Saba, a Yahudi who started the Rawafid of the Shia. The, the deviant sect called the Jahmiyyah was originated by, the, by Labid ibn al asam He was another Jew. Labid ibn al-A'sam 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 bil alif ayn sad mim Labid ibn al-A'sam was also a Yahudi he was also a Jew we're not saying this in order to now some people will try to say that you're anti-Semitic which would in which you will find that in the origin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned the Jews and dispraised them because of their history and what they have done. As tarikh speaks for itself and the facts speak for itself. Are we saying generally that all of them are like that of today? We say that they're kuffar. We say that they're what? They're not Muslims. And they're people of, of kuffar upon a way, a way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it is what? It is unacceptable their legislation of what they're upon. However, ya ma'ish al ikhwah do we condemn that a person mistreat a non-Muslim in a manner in which you'll find? A lot of people do these days, which will be a bad form of da'wah. That is what we condemn. As we want to display all the great forms of Islam. However, we still talk about the history and we speak the facts of what took place. And there's no denying the facts and you cannot argue the facts. The fact is, is that these deviant sects will start by a Jew. That's the facts. The facts is the facts. That these deviant sects were started by a Jew. And that we know at the last days and times, when the Antichrist, when he comes, that the majority of the people will be following him, likewise will be Jews, and likewise will be the Khawarij, and likewise those who will be for the Munafiqeen. People who are upon hypocrisy, and that the greatest of those who are upon hypocrisy are the Shia and the Rawafid. You'll find from the followers of the Antichrist, the Messiah, the Jah, when, when he comes in the la last days of times on this earth, that the majority of those who will follow him will be from the Yahud. They will be from, they will be from the who? They will be from the Jews. That is something that the Messenger of Allah informed. 
that will be a lot of his followers. Along with them also are the Khawarij. And the Khawarij are the ones who started the what? Oh, excuse me, the Jews are the ones who started the what? The Khawarij. So they'll also be from the Antichrist what? Followers. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? They'll be from his followers. And also those who will be from his followers are who? The Munafiqi. People who are upon hypocrisy. And that the heads of those who are upon hypocrisy are the Shia and the Rawafud. And which you'll find in that area that they say to this day, where the Masih al-Dajjal will emerge from that area. He will emerge from the area to pointing towards Iran and somewhere in that vicinity. That's when he will, he will come and he will return. Especially in, in around that area behind. Behind Iran in that area is somewhere where they say where the Dajjal will come and he will emerge. And those who will follow them will be the most deviant sect or the most harmful sects upon the Muslims who are the Khawarij, the Rawafid, and the Yahud. And all of them are the ones who what? started each other. If not, the Yahud is the one that started the, the Rawafid, and he also was part of founding the what? The Khawarij. As we know, Abdullah ibn Sabah was the one who stirred up and aroused the fitna of the people against, against Uthman and also Ali in order that they, be, that they be killed. That he played a tremendous role and starring the first bloodshed of the Ummah Muhammad, which is the kill of Uthman ibn Affan, in which the Messenger of Allah said that if the safe for the sword was to fall in my Ummah, that it would never stop until the day of resurrection. And it all started with the killing, the murder of Uthman ibn Affan And like we said, the one who played a major role in his killing, and his assassination was who? Was Abdullah ibn Sabah. So, You'll find that the majority of the deviant sects were started by non-Muslims. Also in regards to the Qadr, what happened with Ma'bad al-Juhani. Ma'bad al-Juhani, Ghilan al-Dimashqi, who started the deviant sect of the Qadr, the Qadriya. It was started with a non-Muslim. Who am a non-Muslim whose name was Susan. Susan. Or is it called Susan? Or Susan was the one who Ma'bad al-Juhani and Ghilan al-Dimashqi took the ideologies of the deviant, ideologies of the pre-divine decree of Allah, started with a non-Muslim. You'll find that... Je Does everyone understand what I'm saying? What? Susun. They translate it as Susun. Not Susan or Susun. Susun. Be seen. Be, be seen. Seen. Wow. Seen. Noon. Susun. No. Five. The point of the matter is that they were all started by what? Non Muslims. Non Muslims. No. Abdullah ibn Saba pretended to be Muslim. Not Susan. Susan was a kafir. He was a non Muslim. You get it mixed up. As far as as far as Abdullah ibn Saba, he pretended to be Muslim. The same thing that Paul did to Jesus. Same exact thing. No different. Paul, Bulus, Pulus for the Christians. Abdullah ibn Saba to the Muslims was Paul to the Christians. Same thing. No different. He, put, he came in the, in the guise of a follower of Jesus, but his ultimate goal was to corrupt what he came with. Was of Tawheed, monotheism. And he corrupted it. He did it. He carried out what he wanted. He changed the whole religion of what? Of Jesus, the son of Mary, and his message. Until the majority of the Christians are what they're upon today is the message of, of Paul, not the message of Jesus, the Son of Mary. The ideologies that Allah is a part of God and God is a part of Allah or third and three or that he's the son or he's a part broken off from God. All that was an ideology that Paul incorporated later on in order to corrupt what Jesus came with. Paul was, was, the, was a Jew. <laughs> Likewise, Paul was a Jew. He was a Yahudi. He was a Jew. He was a Jew that came in, a, in the form of what? A follower of Jesus. Showing that he was a follower of what? What he came with? A revelation of monotheism, unification of Allah, the same exact thing. Came in, in, in disguise in order to get close to him, but he was a, a what? A hypocrite that was hiding, concealing what? Hypocrisy and evil that he was plotting to, to carry out. But however, Paul had did it. Paul changed the message of Jesus to Son of Mary to something else. Something of polytheism and something, something that was totally in contrast to what Jesus the Son of Mary came with. The whole religion of Jesus the Son of Mary became changed in something that is incorporated in it of, if you want to say, Sufia, <laughs> Sufia, and all different types of, of if you want to say, 
of uh, of Shirkiyat to polytheism, which was incorporated later on. All of it was due to Paul. He started that. And if you look into studying what the Christians believe, it's a type of Sufia. For example, the belief that Jesus is a part of God, it's a mystical form where the where God is one with the with the Son and the Son is one with God, or he's one part not broken off. That's the ideologies of the Sufia. They believe the same thing. The same thing that Ibn Arabi al Ta'i believes, which God is one with the human being, and the human being becomes one with what? With God. It's the same thing. You'll find that the 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 words are the same, but the method is still what? It's the same. Even though that it might have been done to different people or different messages during the specific times with certain prophets, but the me- but the same method was one. It was a type of Sufia with the Christians are upon the day. It's th- something that's mixed with a Sufia, stuff that is mixed with a, a polytheism, and mixed with a whole bunch of innovative practices, all mixed into one. This is what they're upon, and it's the same thing that was done to the Christians that corrupted what they're upon, was the same thing that was tried, that the attempt was done upon Islam. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that the, the correct understanding of Islam will be protected, even though there will be people that will try to corrupt it. So the callers are there of evil, but the religion is still intact. They are not able to carry out what Paul had did to what? Did to the message or the revelation which Jesus the Son of Mary came with. It's the same thing, same method. But at any rate, Paul to the Christians, Abdullah ibn Sabah, who was a Jew, to the Muslims, is the same thing of Paul, who was a Jew, to the Christians. Same thing. Is it clear? As you said, you'll find that even for them, those who study from the Christians with facts, not their feelings, facts. Because with the Christians, the majority of them, they like to argue what they feel. No, 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 no. We want to argue with facts. You can't argue the facts. The fact is that the majority of what the Christians believe and what they practice in which they themselves, even their own scholars, have affirmed that the majority of the Christians in the world follow the, follow the message of Paul, not the, not the what? The message of Jesus, the son of Mary. They do not follow the message of Jesus, the son of Mary. They follow the message of Paul. That's why you'll find a lot of them that they say that Paul is the one who has more of an influence upon the Christians than Jesus. As he first, the first of those who have the most influential personality, or implement, the most influence. As far as the, the, the great personality of those who walked the earth, they say number one was the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two is Paul. Number three is Jesus. Why Paul come, became the second? Because the majority of Christians followed the ideologies of Paul, not Jesus. Is it clear what I'm saying? They followed the message of, of Paul, the distorted message that he came because he hated what Jesus came with. He was plotting against them. And he what? He came and get close to him. He changed his what? Message. So he's the one that incorporated all these different type of polytheistic, uh, if you polytheistic type of ways and beliefs in order to what? For the people to go astray. And as a result of it, like we said, he, con- he carried out what he did and it was accomplished. In contrast to Abdullah ibn Saba, Abdullah ibn Saba caused a lot of fitna. A lot of fitna. The most evil of sects of today are all from his doing. He was a Jew. It started with the who? The Ru'afiq who are the most deviant, most evil of, of, of sects upon the Muslims of today, who they say their missiles right now is pointing at Mecca. They're just waiting for the right time. And, and they already made an attempt to shoot a muscle, missile at Mecca a couple of years ago. They're the one that also played a major part in the terrorism and a lot of the terrorism that took place in the country and a lot of different countries. And still to this day, they're the ones who are plotting and have a major involvement inside a lot of terrorism that's taking place in the world today. They are heavily involved, heavily involved in it, and they play a major role in it. And they're the Rawafa, they're the Shia, who was started by a Jew. If you cannot argue the facts, these are the facts. Rather, you'll find from the, from, if you look, as a matter of fact, I don't want to get into politics, but I'll just give you an example of what's taking place. Well, a couple of years ago, the one who killed himself and killed a lot of innocent people, who strapped bombs and killed himself, who had a great, who played the role in it, it happened in Medina about three, year, three years ago. At any rate, right by the Harlem, by Medina. At any rate, they found that the Shia would play the, a major part in it. They played a major role in it. So they were looking for him, he escaped, and he went back to, to Iran. Iran, as we know, once a person enters in their own country, they have their own policy where it is that they give them asylum, which is 
that you cannot extradite anyone of your own. Rather, a person, once you come back to your own country, you're grant, automatically granted asylum. We're not going to give you up to anyone who you probably maybe have caused corruption in their land. We're not giving you up. We're not returning you back to that country that you committed that crime in. Khalas, he came back into our country. We give him grant him peace, grant him asylum. He's from our own. We're not going to extradite him. What does that mean? Let me break it down. Basically, what happened, they paid, they had someone stirring up fitna inside of Medina, Mecca. Someone killed a lot of innocent people. They knew that the Shia were involved. So they fled back to Iran. The people who, when they, I guess when they found that they were about to be exposed, they fled back to Iran. So we know uh, the King Suleiman and all of them from the Wulat al-Amr said, hand them over. He's, this person has to be what? Well, he has to have this, his justice established upon him. He killed innocent people, murdered innocent people. You had, they had involvement in it. He said, no, 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 we're not handing them over to you. They're from our own people. This is from the many events of the events that have occurred with the Shia Rawafa. The Rawafa brothers and sisters know they have done an act of war these days. And the one who's being patient is the ruler in Saudi Arabia. He's just taking the hits. It was so ironic and strange how shaitan stirs up to talk about the Saudi Arabian government on the tongues of so many people. And they don't say one word about your Iran. Not one word. And they have done the most, the most despicable, filthiest things across history of killing of in millions and millions of innocent Muslims. And they had everything, they had things to do with it. All you got to do is read the history of what the Shia and the Rawafa did, of how the Muslims and how they were even affiliated in, and even in cahoots with, with the Mongolians. When they came in the country, the Shia was the one that opened the door for them. When the Mongolians caved in and ravaged and had pillage of innocent millions and millions of people were killed. You know who opened the door for the Tartars to come in? It was the Rawafa. The Shia. And still to this day, it's the same thing. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. They have, thought they have started an act of war on so many times. Certain shooting ballistic missiles over the border. Can you imagine someone right now shooting a missile from Mexico over to the United States? What will be happening right now? It'll be an act of war. That's what's going on in Iran, in Saudi Arabia. They shot missiles across the border and some of them landed in the country. But the king is realizing, listen, this is going to be war. It's going to be bloodshed. All right, so we'll just take the hit. We'll just take it. This is what they're going through. In order to maintain a balance, so it won't be an act of war, so innocent people will now start being murdered and killed. And at the same time, you see everybody in the world talking bad about Saudi Arabia. And you have the nerve to talk bad about Saudi Arabia when you got Iran, who's the most despicable and filthiest of people which they do not say one word about. Not one word. You go to the common folk, man, he's, he's Munafiqeen of Saudi Arabia. Why don't you, you, I noticed that you always talk about Saudi Arabia. All these other governments that have adopted a, of, 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 of communism in their countries, and liberalism in their countries, you don't say one word. But it's all Saudi Arabia. Because you know that they are doing what's right. They're the only ones left doing what's right. Because everybody else fell, fell into what they fell into. But not one word about Iran. Not one word about Iran is Shia. Not one word do you hear him speaking about. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Shows the, con the, the contradictive of the affair, right? How people contradict themselves. Sitting in the country, sitting in the TV, oh, Saudi Arabia, oh, Munafiqeen, I rude blah, blah, blah. Play, why don't you say the same thing about those, those filthy bond Shia who shot ballistic missiles across the border, who start, who's picking on the country to start a war? Which if they do and it starts a world, it will be an effect that's going to affect everyone all around the world. Because the Rawafa are doing the tahalif with what? With Russia. And it's going to also, not only Russia, who's going to get involved, China will get involved. It's going to be a door effect upon, just make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that none of this never happens. But the, the, just know that the kingdom of Saudi Arabia are taking hits after hits after hits after hits after hits. It's like somebody coming to you, smack, just keep punching you in the face, and you just keep just basically just taking it on the chin. And it's like, okay, I'll take that. I'm not going to do a react that would just to prove a point, but I'm just looking at these millions of other people whose, whose blood might be lost, whose blood might be, innocent people might be killed. I'll keep getting punched in the face. No problem. I'll keep doing it. That's what's going on in Saudi Arabia right now. Can you imagine somebody just keeps punching your face every now and then, just real hard, just keep punching you, just, and then you just, just taking it, just like, 
just keep taking it. Because you know behind it is, is, is millions of other people who's at stake. Can you imagine? But all around the world, everyone talks bad about Saudi Arabia. Yeah, he don't know what's going on. Not one word about the Shia. Not one word about the Rawafa. Not one word about these, these fools. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? At any rate. At any rate, what we was discussing. We were saying that the most dangerous of deviant sects are, was started by non-Muslims. From them is the Rawafid. The Rawafid, the Aqidah, brothers and sisters, used to be, they used to be Mushabiha. They used to be from the deviant sects. As we know, the deviant sect was called the people of Tashbi. Tashbi, who used to resemble the attributes of Allah, the names of the attributes with the attributes of the human being. That was the Aqidah of the Shia from before, in the first stage. There was a deviant sect from the Shia, his name was Hisham ibn al-Hakam al-Rafidi. His name was Hisham ibn al-Hakam. Hisham ibn al-Hakam al-Rafidi. He used to be upon the Aqidah of the Mushabiha, of the people who resemble Allah with the creation. The people who resemble Allah with the creation. That was the Aqidah of the Rawafid in, in the time of old. Did it change? To now the latter Rawafid and Shia all have the Aqidah of the Mu'tazila. All the, 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 Shia, the Aqidah of the Shia of today, of the, the, these latter days, or these later or these present days, or these current days that we're living in, or contemporary days, all have the, the creed, the belief of the Mu'tazila. And I'll talk about that inshallah, don't worry. So in, in the beginning, the deviant sect, who's called the Shia, the Rawafid, used to have the belief of the people, of, what they, of the deviant sect called Tishbi. Tishbi meaning the people who resemble Allah with his creation. For example, that Allah's face is like the face of a human being. Or Allah's hand is like the hand of a human being. Or like Allah's foot is like the foot of the human being. That was a deviant sect called the Mushabbiha, which is a deviant sect. It was a deviant sect from the Muslims. They don't exist today. A sect called the Mushabbiha. But their ideologies are still what? Present. We'll talk about that in a minute, inshallah. However, that does not prevent that maybe they might emerge again. So they still mention in the books, you'll find that the ulama of the past, they collected, such as Ibn Hazm, because a book called Al-Milal wa Nihal. Al-Milal wa Nihal. Like the different sects and the different ways, in which you'll find that he gathered all the sects of, of the Muslims from the past, whether they be from the Khawarij and the deviant sects that they deviated from, because they have, because the Khawarij different, deviated into different, into more different, more different deviant sects. The West wasn't the Khawarij, they even, became more and more deviant, deviant sects. There was a deviant sect from the Khawarij of the past called the Najdat. The Najdat. At any rate, y'all get me too far off. But at any rate, just focus on what I'm saying. In regards to the Shia, the first part of the Shia, the first part in the early generation, they used to be Mushabiha. So keep that in mind. They were called Mushabiha, and the leader of that particular sect from the, from the Shia, his name was Hisham ibn al-Hakam, Al-Rafidi. Hisham ibn al-Hakam al-Rafidi. Then it switched. Later, when they all adopted the ideologies of the Mu'tazila. All of the Shia today, you'll finally have the ideologies of the Mu'tazila. And that is true because I even had experience with one who was, who was a Shi'i. And he was speaking bad about Abu Hurairah and he said that Allah is not above. He's not above. And he was Shi'i. And I was like, why did they believe that Allah is not above? I said, that's the aqeedah of the Mu'tazila. And this was earlier when I first became Muslim. So I used to scratch my head, why does he have the aqeedah? That's the Mu'tazila. So then when I read, and when I started reading and acquiring knowledge, we started going over, see, I was like, oh, okay. Now it makes sense. All of the Shia have the aqeedah of the Mu'tazila. Is it clear what I'm saying? Type. In regards to now, the Shia, uh, uh, no, we finished, alhamdulillah, we finished the Shia. Well, let me just keep reading about them. As you'll find that from their ideologies is that they so-called, they exhibit or they manifest 
their love for Al Al Bayt, of course, as we know, for the family of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the immediate family. I don't think that if not the, the further family was not included. I got to think there was an exception to the rule. But at any rate, that they so-called go to the extremes and they so-called claim that of love for the family of the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasalam for Ali and Fatima, radiallahu anha Zahra, radiallahu anhu Abba. They so-called claim. <clears throat> However, like we said, they were the one that put forth the most corruption in the religion. And you still see the effects of it today, of today. To the point where even Ali, when the first when the Shia manifests, you'll find that when Ali, when they claimed him to be a deity, or a deity of worship, when they tried to deitize him, we know that Ali what, condemned him. As we all know, right everyone, the story of what happened with Ali, when the first of the Shia manifests during his time, due to Abdullah ibn Saba, al-Yahudi, the Jew, when they made Ali a deity, a ilah, until we know that Ali ibn Abi Talib had what? And condemned them for this, this type of what? This type of nonsense. Until he gave them some days to make toba, until he was forced to burn them with fire. In order to show the despicable filth of what they were upon. And how Abdullah ibn Sabah al Yahudi was able to get in their minds and poison it to the extent that even Ali ibn Abi Talib was not evil to bring them back to the truth. To let you know how evil, once it's like poison, once it's now been absorbed in the heart, it's very, very difficult to remove it. After it's been what? Deep rooted inside of the heart. That's the reason why you'll find that, that Ahl Sunni used to warn from what? From innovations due to the severity of it, of how it can stick and cling to the heart to the point where if one now comes with evidence and clear proofs that they still will remain upon what's incorrect due to the fact that it's a severe disease and sickness. But at any rate, I don't want to keep going this out of what we mentioned. That he said, but Shaykh al Islam mentioned in Hajj al Sunnah and other books, he says about the Ruwaf of the Shia. He says, في كثير من كتبه قولا إذا طلع عليه الإنسان عرف حالهم إنهم أشد الناس ضررا على الإسلام وإنهم هجر المساجد وعمر المشاهد. As we talked talk about and discuss in regards to Tawheed, Shaykh al Islam put everything in perspective when he said the statement: They are the most severest of people. In regards to their harm against Islam, they left off the masajid and they glorified the mashahid. They glorified the graves, the graveyard of worshiping the dead, the people who are dead. And they started building, building masajid upon graves. They were the first of those who started this evil, uh, this evil sunnah. Rather you even find it that they say, لا نصلي جماعة إلا خلف إمام معصوم ولا معصوم الآن ما ظهر صاحب السرداب He said we do not pray in congregation except upon an imam that's معصوم an imam that is what? That he's been protected or an imam that's infallible I mean he's not capable of making any mistake That is the imam that we what? Follow or we pray behind And to this day they have not found an imam that's معصوم to this day, they have not found an infallible imam to pray behind. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? To this day. And they are the first of those that Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah mentioned in his book called Kitab al-Minhaj. They are the first of those who opened up the evil sunnah of what? Of grave worshiping. They're the ones who started it, the Shia. They built masajid upon the graveyards. They started praying in the graveyards, built a masajid upon the graves, Raising domes and high structures upon them to the end of it. They're the ones who started it. And like we said, who adopted their ways were the, were the Sufiya. The Sufiya took the Sunnah from the Shia. Because you'll find that a lot of the Sufis are involved, heavily involved inside of grave worshiping. And worshiping the dead. And worshiping people who have passed. You'll find this is a great Sunnah that the Sufis are upon. They took this ideology from the Shia. So this Sunnah was not taken from the, the Salaf. It was taken from the Ruafid, from the Shia. You find that the majority of them, as we said, a Sufiya fihim Rafid. A Sufiya fihim Rafid. You find that the majority of the Sufiyas, you find a great Imam, Sheikh Rabi, Hafidullah Ra'ah, Hamil Liwal Jarh al Jarhu Ta'di Bihaq. رغم أنوف الحزبيين وأعداء السنة 
that he said that the Shia fihim rafud. The Shia, or the, oh, excuse me, the Sufiya fihim rafud. That the Sufis they have within them rafud. What does he mean by that? The Sufis have within them rafud, meaning ideologies of the rafud. Why? Because the majority of them worship what? Graves of people who are dead. They took that from who? And they also built massage it upon the graves and they raise them and they magnify them, consecrate them, glorify them. They took that directly from who? The Shia. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? And to the point, like we said, that the majority of some of Ahl Ilm do not even count them of being from the deviant sects of Islam at all. Rather, you'll find that some of them say they're outside the fold of Islam. The Rawafud. You'll find that a lot of Ahl Ilm mention that. that. They're not even in the fold of Islam, a lot of them. They are outside and not even considered from the, from the deviant sects that the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, mentioned in the Thetri Hadith about those who will go stray from his ummah. That they're not even counted from them. You'll find that some of Ahl Ilm that mention that. That they're not even counted from the deviant sects. Taib, what about Jeff and the Safwan? So that's enough about the Shia. Even though there's more details than that, but I think that'll suffice. Then we have to talk about the uh, Imamiyah, Ithna Ashariya. Then we have to talk about Sahib al-Sirdab. And they have to talk about their so-called Mahdi, the, the fake Mahdi. The, <laughs> then the nonsense of them goes on and on and on and on and on. But anyway, as far as, like we said, as they say, the chickens come home to roost, all everything will fall into place at the last days and times when the Antichrist manifests. Like we talked about, there will be an Antichrist. We believe in that. Like we said, the majority of the Antichrist will be hypocrites, Jews, and also the Khawarij, who are all started by the Jews. <laughs> the Khawarij, the Munafiqeen, hypocrites, and the Yahud will be the followers of the Antichrist. Who will be fighting the Antichrist, everyone? The Muslims. Who are the Sunni Muslims who will be fighting the the, uh, the Masih, the Jal, the Ahl uh, Sunnah? The Muslims, the follower of the Prophet. And who will be aiding them and fighting the Antichrist? Who will be standing by their side? Jesus, the Son of Mary. Aiding the Muslims and fighting the Antichrist. Aiding the Salafis. <laughs> aiding Ahl uh, Sunnah. Jesus, the Son of Mary, will descend. Descending in the last days of times of Babu Lut, which is right now in Syria. Babu Lut, and we'll talk about that later. He'll be descending upon two angels, which is to let you know Jesus right now is not dead because he did not die because he never was crucified. He never died on the cross in the first place. So that's the reason why he's living now in the heavens in a way that Allah knows best. Do not ask how. The kafia of it is not known with us, even though there is a way that is done. We do not know it. When Jesus, the Son of Mary, descends, which shows that Allah is above the heavens because the angels will descend from the heavens with Jesus between them, which shows that Allah is above. Because if Allah was not above, why did the two angels have to descend with Jesus, the Son of Mary? Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Everything that us, the Son and the Son of Peace, believe is clear as the sun in the sky. It's clear. You see, everything is connected. Those from the Shia, from those of the followers of the Antichrist will be from the Yahud, the hypocrites, and at the head of the hypocrites is the Shia, and also, like we said, who? The Khawarij. The Khawarij will be from them. Who are they considered the terrorists of today? The terrorists will be from the main of the followers of the Masihi Dajjal, along with the Jews, the Khawarij, and the hypocrites. In some narrations, it says from from the women also be a lot of their followers. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But anyway, Yama Ashul Ikhwa, that is to show how everything is, co is what? Is connected. Even the people of evil are connected. Even the Antichrist in the last days, the, the people of Bid'a is going to follow the, the, the Masih al Dajjal. The people of deviation and the people of deviant sex also will be from the followers of the Masih al Dajjal. So it's not it will just be the people of disbelief. But even deviant sex will be from them. And at the head of them is the Khawari. Will be from the deviant sex, who will be from the followers of the Antichrist in the last days and times. Clear what I'm saying, everyone? 
Boy, but enough about the Shia. Let's talk about the Jehmiya. So now we talked about the Jehmiya, who their ideologies has a major effect upon the Muslims of today. Boy, we talked about, said that the Jehmiya was also started by a Jew. That's the fact. So we're not saying this in order to now go out for anyone to now kill a Jew. No, we're not saying that, brothers and sisters. You cannot do that. That is impermissible, and that's the way of the Khawadij. So you cannot stop a wrong with another wrong, and then die in that state, and you could be from the, the dogs of the hellfire. It's not for you to now spread mass hysteria and mayhem upon people who's upon kufr in a non-Muslim land. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? You cannot go out and kill Yahud, or kill Christians, or kill Jews. You cannot take the law into your own hands. It is impermissible. And if you do that, Ahlul Sunnah will condemn you for doing that. We will condemn you for doing that. And we will be very, very hard against you for doing that. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? But still, the fact remains, the facts is the facts. Those, these deviant sects still were started by Jews. That's the fact. We're not condemning to go out and murder them on the street. But still, we have to say, say the facts. These are the facts. That the deviant sect of the Jehmiya was started by a Jew whose name was the Bid Ibn al asam who's the one who was accused of making magic upon the Prophet. The Bid Ibn al asam passed it on to who? Like we said, to, to Talut. Talut passed it on to, to who? Aban ibn Sam'an. Aban ibn Sam'an passed it on to Ja'd ibn Dirham. Ja'd ibn Dirham. Ja'd ibn Dirham was the one who, the first of those who denied that was Allah was above the heavens. He was the first one who Ja'd ibn Dirham was murdered and killed by Khadid al Qasri, Khadid ibn Abdullah al Qasri, who was in the wilayah of Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. I don't feel like talking about that right now. Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, I think that was he was in his wilayah. But anyway, Ja'd ibn Dirham. Pass it on to Jahmin ibn Safwan. Jahmin ibn Safwan was killed by a man. His name was Salam. Some of them say Salama ibn Ahwaz. Salama ibn Ahwaz. Jad ibn Dirham was killed by Khalid ibn Abdullah al Qasri. Khalid ibn Abdullah al Qasri. Jahm ibn Safwan was killed not by Khalid al Qasri. Jahm ibn Safwan was killed by Salama ibn Ahwaz, who was from the authorities of Nasr ibn Sayyar al Kanani. If you study history, it will blow your mind to let you know how all these devious sects go back to a non Muslim. <laughs> Because the non-Muslims know that the power and the strength of the Muslims go back to them being unified upon one belief system. The non-Muslims know that. That's why they started to plant the seed of what? Deviant sex amongst them to extremely weaken them. And they did it. And the Muslims follow it to this day. The non-Muslims... Had knew the fiqh that the Muslim strength relied on them being unified, unified upon one aqidah, one belief, one methodology. They know that they had fear of it. That if one day if the Muslims come back to their mind, come back to you know, come back to their senses, one day, inshallah, they know what can happen. So in order to stop that, they planted the seed of deviation amongst them. That's why Abdullah bin Sabah al Yahudi knew this. Like, well, how are the Muslims, where did their strength lie? They knew that their strength lied in their what? Unification in their belief system. That's why he started the deviant sects of the Khawarij and the Shia. To render them extremely weak. And it's still taking place today. And the only people who have woken up from this nightmare and realized this is the Salafis. Ahl Sunnah, Ahl Hadith, Salafi. They're the only ones who have woken out of this ghafla. The rest of the Muslims are still, you know what? Are still, if you, if you want to say, fi ghaflatihim ya'mahun. 
still in their drunken state, still being prancing around, still thinking that politics is going to solve their problem. And it's not. The only thing that's going to solve their problem is to return back to what you're studying right now, which is Kitab al-Tawheed, and to know the monotheism of Allah and to know what shirk is. That's what's going to solve the problem. Not being involved inside of non-Muslim politics. Let the non-Muslims be in their own business. Let them do what they do, thinking that that's going to solve their issues, in which they even themselves seeing it's not solving their issues. Five, so what's the, what's the solution? Except what we're doing right now. They clear what I'm saying, everyone. Tayyip, the Jahmiyyah was started, like we said, initially by Jahmiyyah al Asam, but know that also, Jahmiyyah al Safwan, one of the ways he adopted the, the e deviant methods was because he used to what? To debate. I want everyone to realize this. Jahmiyyah al Safwan was affected so much. Because he wanted to debate debate with the non-Muslims. That is the history of Jahmiyyah al Safwan, who's the biggest of evil sects upon the Muslims of today. He wanted to debate with the non-Muslims from the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians. So what he did was he came with the same philosophy because he started debate with them with philosophy. Philosophy. He started dealing with them, trying to debate with them in their own type of what? ideologies. So basically he tried to distinguish fire with fire. He tried to combat what was wrong with another wrong, which was incorrect. So instead of using proper revelation, he used philosophy and rhetoric, rhetoric of the Christians and the Jews and the Sabians until he adopted this way and he incorporated it inside the religion. And as a result of it, the also balaya, all the atrocities of the most worst or the most evil devious sect started for Jeff and Sofwan because of him debating, debating, arguing, debates, and him also uh, adopting their ways and, their, and promoting their ways, trying to debate with them with their own type of concepts. As a result of it, he incorporated it in the religion, which is a philosophy and a belief of the Sabians and the philosophers and logic and to the end of it, until you see all the atrocities, atrocities of Jehovah's Sofwan, which came as a result of it, he started to worship a deity in which he even said that does not exist externally. There does, there's no such thing as a God that exists externally. There's only an internal uh, deity what the mind fathoms. That's where it ended up. This type of confusion, which ultimately led him of leaving off the prayer for 40 days and 40 nights. Confused. And that is what all these type of ideologies of philosophy or all this rhetoric, that's what it leads to. Doubt, in the, doubt within yourself, doubt within your creator, doubt with what you're about. Is it clear what I'm saying? So if you see somebody come with you, coming with you with fancy words, can't fancy words. Allah is, is immaterialistic. He's an immaterialistic void that you don't understand. These are the words of the philosophers in which Jeff and the went down that road and that's the reason why he fell into destruction. Be clear? When you see these people start using these fancy words that, is just, that you think you're intrigued by because they're using these high level vocabulary that intrigues your mind, Allah Taala the other is in, immaterialistic, of, of, of far, far above what the mind can fathom of what the intrinsic way material which the matter forms from. When you start hearing that, that is the words of Ahl Kalam. That is the speech of the people of rhetoric that the Salaf used to warn from. You understand? Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? As soon as you hear that, Allah is not a body. Allah is not. Notice that, and plus, what's a, their famous way of methodology is praising Allah is, also, is always negation. Allah is not a body. Allah is not in a place. Allah is not this. Allah doesn't. Allah does not. <laughs> Allah is not above. Allah is not a body. Allah is not in a direction. Allah is not such as, Allah is not this, Allah is not that, Allah is not that, Allah is not, negation, 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 negation. Type. 
They came with the words, for example, place. Allah is not a place. Oh, Allah doesn't move. Allah does not sit. Allah does not. They came with these words in order to cause confusion. They're the ones that initially started these words in regards to Allah. You understand, everyone? And I'll teach you how to refute this later on. You understand, everyone? The origin of what a person is supposed to use is to stick what comes in kitab and sunnah. That's it. Any word that does not come in kitab and sunnah, do not use it. Is it clear what I'm saying? Do not use it. The people of falsehood came with these words to cause the people confusion. For example, the people of Bid'a will come to you and they will say, Do you believe Allah is in a place? So what they've done was they came with a word, which is a word that was never used with the salaf. Use it in your speech to cause confusion. You believe Allah is in a place? Ah, answer my question. Do you believe Allah is in a place? First of all, we say to them, when you say the word place, place was never used with the salaf. They never say Allah fi makan kada, that Allah is in such and such place. They never said that. Rather, the people falsely came with the word place in order to cause confusion. Because place can necessitate what is truth and falsehood at one time. The word direction, same thing. If you say jiha, or body, or movement, or sitting. All these words were never used by the Zalaf. They used to stick to what? Came Kitab and Sunnah. That Allah is above. Allah is above the throne. Allah is above the heavens. That was it. The people bit out wanted to cause confusion. So the people of rhetoric from Jeff and Sofwan and all of them and other than them who followed their way came with some fancy words to confuse people. So they started coming with these words. Allah is not a body. Allah is not in a place. Allah is, is an immaterialistic type of substance. To the end of it. Is it clear what I'm saying? It came with these words to cause confusion. The origin of these words is easy to refute. I don't have time to do it right now. But at any rate, this is what Jeff and Sofa have time to get into it right now. Because it's easy. It's easy to refute. I don't have time to do it right now. But at any rate, this is Jeff and Sofa. Jeff and Sofa, who's Akita at first, like we, like we said, was to believe that Allah Taala has names without any meanings to them. That Allah Taala has names, but they have no meaning to them. That was one of the stages of the Jahmiyyah. That was one of the stages. <clears throat> Inshallah, I gave you guys the benefit of what was the reason of why the Khilafah it was the Khilaf of the Amawiyah. Why the, the strongest nation of the Muslims were brought down. Why was it? I gave you guys a reason. About six months ago. I read it from the Aqidah to Salaf. I gave it to everyone. Did you guys forget? What was the reason why? It's one of the two kingdoms. As we know, the greatest kingdom of Muslims was the Abbasi tribe and the what? And the Amawi tribe. Oh, excuse me, the Amawi Khilafah, excuse me. The Amawi Khilafah. One of them was brought down. You know, you know why it was brought down? Because they adopted the bid'ah of Jahmu Sufwan, or of Ja'ad, the Bidirham. The Khilaf, the Khalifa at the time was called, oh, what is his name? Such and such Ja'diya. They called him Ja'di because he adopted the ways of Ja'ad the Bidirham. And as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Ibn al Qayyim mentions, Allah sent a punishment upon his kingdom because of him adopting the ways of the, of the what? Of Ja'ad ibn Dirham was the ways of the Jahmiyyah. As a result of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the kingdom. Sent a, king, a, a punishment upon the kingdom because of them adopting the ideologies of Ja'ad ibn Dirham. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? The kingdom was decimated, destroyed, done, brought down. Because they started adopting the ways of the Jahmiyyah, who was initially started by Ja'ad ibn Dirham. That's why the Khalifa, Ibn al Qayyim, should say he was called such as a Ja'diyya, because he adopted the ways of, the Jah, of Ja'ad ibn Dirham, who was the first one to deny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not above the heavens, and that Allah did not take Ibrahim as a Khalil, nor did he speak to Musa with a speech. It's extremely weird, isn't it, everyone? 
Is it clear what I'm saying? Play it. So now as we go on to mention the say, this is the, the method of the Jahmiya. I say it had different stages. I don't have time to talk about all today as we don't want to keep going into it. There's more than to talk about the Jahmiya, but they had stages. But ultimately, they then eventually ended up negating all the names and the attributes of Allah to be with that. They were the first ones to bring the ideologies that the Qur'an is makhluq. They were the first ones who also said in the aspect of the Qadr that all the slaves and the servants of the, of the, of the ibad, of the people, the, of humanity, have been forced. They had no choice in the matter, in the matter, of, in the matter at all, excuse me. They had no choice in the matter. They all been forced in the Bab al-Qadr. They all deviated. They believed the Qur'an is created to the end of the nonsense of what they believe. And all the atrocities of the Muslims from the deviant sects all have been passed down from Jahb al Safwan, whether it be from the Mu'taziyah, then the Maturidiyah, then the Karamiyah, and then the Ash'ariyah. The Ash'ariyah, the Maturidiyah came out the Ash'ariyah. But before that, before, I'll say it again in this order. The Jahmiyyah, the Mu'taziyah, then, I think who came after that was the Karamiyyah, then the Kullabiyyah, then the Ash'ariyah, then the Maturidiyah. And all of them, if you'll find, all of them have some type of effect or ideology which went back to the Jahmiyyah. Every single last one of them. Did you clear what I'm saying? Every single last one of them have some type of effect either directly or indirectly from the Jahmiyyah. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? From the Sha'ira, the Maturidiya, the Kullabiya, and also the Karamiya, the Mu'tazila, and then the Jahmiya. Are you guys with me or are you not with me? You guys have to know about this. Because there's no Muslim out there except the, the, a lot of them from the majority of them that are upon these ways and these ideologies. You'll find that a lot of them are upon these ways. And, and upon these beliefs. And you have to know what's the origin of it. So you know what's the origin of it, you're able to what? Totally reject it. Say so all these beliefs and these devious texts started with a Jew, started with a person of Kufr, caused the, the kingdoms of the, of the Muslims to be destroyed. Hmm. That makes me now think to what? Stay far away from it. Exactly. Somebody you'll find in the street, a Muslim, average Muslim walk down the street, you believe Allah is above, what he'll say to you? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere, or Allah exists without a place. Which is worse than what the Christians say. Because at least the Christians say, even though it's wrong, our Father which is in heaven. So they're affirming the ulu of Allah. They affirm the aboveness of Allah, even though they say Father, which is incorrect, but they affirm the aboveness of Allah. So these people, what, of the Muslims who deny that Allah is above, you let the Christians be better than you in this aspect, where you're worse than them in this belief system. That Allah Taala is not above or exists without a place is worse than what the Christians believe. And these people say that they're Muslim. That's the reason why you'll find Abdullah bin Mubarak used to say this statement, a profound statement used to say, he said, He says, we used to convey the statements of the Jews and the Christians because Allah conveyed it in his book of the different statements that they say of disbelief. He said, but we used to be shy to convey the statements of the people of the Jahmiyyah due to how wicked and filthy and evil it is. Allah exists without a place. Allah is not above the heavens. Allah has not had any attributes to the end of it, which is worse than what the people of Kufr, what they say about Allah to with Ta'ala, from the people of the book. At least they say that Jesus was one with Allah and that's in one. They say Allah is everywhere and everything. That's worse than what the Christians say. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared them to be upon disbelief based upon that one statement. That they say that Jesus is part of Allah and Allah is part of Jesus. Allah is a third of three or that Allah, Jesus is the son of Allah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself said that's enough in itself to say what? That they, they, that they have fell into disbelief. What about the person saying that Allah is everywhere and everything? It's worse. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? That's the reason why Abdullah bin Mubarak used to say this profound statement. He said... He said, we used to convey the statements to the Jews and the Christians. Why? Because Allah conveyed it in his book. He said, but we used to be shy to convey the statements of the Jahmiyyah. 
because of how filthy and evil and wicked and a higher magnitude of filth and wickedness it is. Allah doesn't have any names. Allah doesn't have any attributes. Allah is not above the heavens. Allah exists without a place to the end of the nonsense. Absolute confusion. Absolute nonsense. That any human being that hears it, you wouldn't even find the majority of those who have these beliefs, except you'll find that they're the most confused people in their religion. And the most doubtful. And they're the most argumentative because they have doubt in themselves. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Jay, now we get back to what we're going to talk about today. Type. So this is just to sum up what we talked about in regards to the Jehmiya and the Rawafat. These is important brothers and sisters that you have to know about in order to protect yourself, that you do not fall from the deviant sex, whether they be from the people of Kufr or they be from the deviant sex from the Muslims. Because like we said, even the non-Muslims realize the strength of the Muslims all relies upon them being unified in one belief and in one methodology. And they know for sure, they know, that if they keep the Muslims in a state of weakness, as long as they keep them in a state of where they've divided and their belief system, not we're talking about bodies. Anybody can unify externally within amongst their bodies. We're talking about purifying the belief system. They know that the Muslims do that one day. They know what's going to happen. And they don't want it to happen again. So that's the reason why they kept them in a very severe, severe, weak state by planning the ideology of what? Of deviant sex amongst them. Of whether it be from the Shia, whether it be from the Rawafilt, and also likewise, the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the deviant sect called the Muslim Brotherhood, was also started by a non-Muslim. A lot of people don't know that. The Ikhwan al-Muslimin, if you go back to the history of it, was started by a non-Muslim. It was started by a non-Muslim who was what they call these days and times. Who's called what, everyone? We'll see if you guys know. What's the name of? You guys, it's easy. Very easy. What's the name of the sect here in America that gathers between all the religions? And they get a little bit from here, a little bit. No, now I'm Muslim. A little bit from here, a little bit from here, and tie it all in together. Who are they? You guys know. Not the Ahmadiyya. Non-Muslims. Well, Ahmadiyya is They do say he's not Muslim. Huh? Hmm. What do you see the little, the little eye thing? The little eye thing, and it has like the little, the cubes that, huh? Illuminati, but they said the, the Masons. The Masons. The Masons is the one that started the deviant sect of the Jamaat al Ikhwan al Muslimin. The Masons started it. If you notice what the Jamaat al Ikhwan al Muslimin are upon, it's the same ideologies of the Masons, the exact same thing. They just want to gather between everybody together, everybody come together, we're all together. It's the same thing. It was started by a Mason. <laughs> I can't remember his name right now. But it was passed on to Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. He was a Mason. He was a Masuni. Jamal al-Din al-Afghani was Masuni. He was a Mason. Jamal al-Din al-Afghani took his ideologies from the Masons, who were not Muslims. So he came to who? Hassan al-Banna. Hassan al-Banna is the founder of what? Not our, our sheikh in, 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 in Egypt, not, not that Hassan al-Banna. Hafidullah. Not talking about our Salafi mashaykh from them is Sheikh Hassan al-Banna. We're not talking about that Hassan al-Banna. It's another Hassan al-Banna. Hassan al-Banna took his knowledge from Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. Jama who also took his knowledge from Jamaat al-Din al-Afghani was Muhammad Abdu. Muhammad Abdu. Muhammad Abdu. He was real famous in Egypt. Very famous. I'm sure some people have probably heard of him. Muhammad Abdu. Taib. All these ideologies were taken from Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. Jamal al-Din al-Afghani was a Masuni. He was a Mason. He was a Mason. He took his knowledge from another Mason. So the origin of the sect, the Jamaat al-Ikhwan al-Mujrimeen, or the call the so-called Muslim Brotherhood, was also the origins of it started from a non-Muslim. Goes back to a non-Muslim. 
do the study and it blows your mind. You understand, everyone? Hassan al was also uh, Hasafi. I think it was Hasafi, it was a type of Sufi. At any rate, just know that it got passed on. The Muslim Brotherhood was also started by what? A non Muslim who's a Mason. I can't remember the name right now. Just look it up. It was started by Jamal ad din al Afghani. He was a Masuni. He passed it on to Hassan Banna. Hassan Banna then passed it on to other people who were so called in the name of what he called rectification of the Muslims. He brought them all together, regardless of their belief system being corrupt or correct. He didn't care. Let's just all come together, which is the fundamental, essential quality of the Jamaat al Ikhwan al Mujrimin of the Muslim Brotherhood of today. Is still the same thing. If you'll find that if a Muslim calls to this type of ideology, this is the way of what was originally came from the Masons. If you go to the Masons, what do they do? They take from a little bit from here, take from a little bit from the Bible, take from a little bit from the Muslim, take away from this part, take away from that, incorporate it, you get what you get. Isn't that what the Masons do or not? Is it clear, everyone? All these deviant sects are all started, and a majority of them have been all started. Like we said, even with the people of the Qadr, we talked about Ma'bad al Juhani and Ghina al Dimashqi, was the start of the deviant sect of the Qadriya. Where did they get their ideology from, everyone? From a non Muslim whose name was Suzun. It's a non Muslim. It's a non Muslim. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Jay. So, that shows that all of these different types of ideologies, how wicked and evil they are in their chain of narrators. It's filthy. It's disgusting. To let you know that the only people who Allah has given tawfiq to wake up from this state of drunkenness and save, to realize the reality was taking place, are the Salafis. Not only did they grasp the concept was correct, but they try to implement what is correct to purify the Muslims of what they have fell into by refuting the deviant ideologies they are upon, which is a, purifi- pure, which is a form of purification to help bring them back to the high esteem they deserve. That's the reason why it is highly praised to condemn bid'ah and to refute them. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Because this will help purify the ranks, and as a result of it, the Muslims will be re- re- redeemed and returned back to the honor in which they what deserve. But you now you have Muslims making war with the people of Tawheed and Sunnah and calling against them and warning against them to the end of it. How do you really think that the Muslims are going to return back to the honor you making war with the uliya of Allah? Huh? Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Jay. So that is what we just discussed. Now, now we'll go back to what we were talking about in the lesson today. I hope that was good for you guys to give you a good glimpse of all the deviant sects. Tayyib. So now as it comes, in Kitab al oh, is it time for the tongue to clear? I'm not sure. Did they then come to the... So. You think? Tafadol, Amir. I say like five, uh, ten. You, th- there's no set time for the, for different for a person wants to call the iqama. The, the the time for the salat, yeah. But the you talking about the iqama? There is no specific text. Oh, he's calling you. Hold on for one second. Allah akbar. Allah akbar. Allah akbar. Allah akbar. Oh, 
حول ولا قوة إلا بالله ادخل في من اين اخذ جمال الدين الافغاني علمه حول ولا قوة إلا بالله من جمال الدين الافغاني أعيد الكلام مرة ثانية، أعيد أعيده علي، ها؟ أعيده. ها؟ He also is, so Jamal Din Afghani originally was a he was a Persian from from Iran. He was a Persian Shadi, uh, Farisi. He was Farsi and he was Shi'i. Jamal Din Afghani. Uh huh. Keep reading. Uh huh. Mm, there we go. There you go. That's where his guns did. If you can't find a part where it says that he started now adopting the ways of the Masons, you'll find it. It'll be, it's there. That's just to sum it up. So it shows that Jamal al Afghani, who was the originator of the Jamal al Ikhwan Muslimin, he was originally a what? A Persian Shi'i. He was a Pharisee Shi'i. Muhammad Abdul. A rich Jewish family. Uh huh. Uh huh. Who, that's all the ideologies of who are Hassan Banna. It's the same exact thing. Trying to gather all the Muslims regardless of bringing everybody together. That's the same thing that he passed on to who? Hassan Banna. He passed it also to, also to who? Muhammad Abdul. That's my own point, whether I was saying or not, everyone. It's right there. It was all, it was all shout out. Many reasons. Yeah. Somewhat, yeah. Matter of fact, yeah. Say Khutub was more. Uh, I don't have time to get into that right now. Not right now. That'll, keep me, that'll get me off track. Brothers, return back to the book. Come on. Come on, Suhail. It's not time for lay down time. Come on. Five, turn back to the book. Like an Ibhath. Ibhath, we had a shay. Ta'amak fi tafasile. Nyanna nahu bi haji leha. إذا وصلت إلى النتيجة أخبرني. طيب وفي صحيح قال علي بن أبي طالب لأبي الهياج. Look at your books, everyone. He said that the message of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم talked about how extremism in regards to the grades of the righteous that it will make him make those grades become idols. Make them become idols which are worshipped besides Allah. So the affair goes back to extremists. Extremists in this affair, which we're talking about, until they made the graves of the dead, whether they be righteous or wretched, they started to worship them. They started to go beyond the bounds in which Allah has set, where the graves of the righteous are only supposed to be done for them two things. Either you make dua for them, and you do not have to be by their grave to make dua for them. Or if you just happen to pass by their grave, then you make the legislated supplications that the Messenger of Allah told to what? To do when you pass by their grave. If you just so happen to pass by their grave. And to also take an exhortation of death. No more, no less. This is the boundaries that Allah has set. The, those from the devious sects especially had transgressed the bounds in this regard. 
So they now started to now exceed the bounds in this regard by now performing worship in the graveyards and in the grave sites. And they started to now worship the dead, whether they be wretched or righteous. Whether they be wretched or righteous. For example, the grave in, in Egypt, which is a famous grave, who is the grave of Bedouin. Bedouin, which is a famous grave in which you'll find that the Egyptians make dua to. And I think they also make tolaf around it, if I'm not mistaken. That Bedawi was Shi'i. He was Shi'i Sufi. He was Shi'i Sufi. If you go to the history of who Bedawi was, he was Shi'i Sufi. So, like we said, they don't even care whether or not the person is righteous or wretched. Rather, be in both circumstances, in both circumstances, both of them are what? Both of those circumstances are incorrect. Which came as a result of it, like we said, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you'll find. That he sent Ali ibn Abi Talib on a mission to an individual from the, from the companions. His name was Abu Hayyaj al Asadi. And he said, Allah aba'athuka ala ma ba'athani Ali Rasulullah sallam. When I not send you upon a mission which the Messenger of Allah sent me upon, that you do not leave any idol except that you have destroyed it. Any idol, whether it be a statue or a picture of a person or a picture of a so called esteemed glorified, consecrated individual who's well respected or a grave that was raised where it was raised high or a dome that was raised high above it or a high structure that was built upon it that was high except that you've been ordered to level it off. You understand everyone? So it was in order, to, in order to shut the door of the people falling into what? Polytheism and eventually starting to worship the dead. So all the doors were shut which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wanted to make sure of, to the best of his ability in which he legislated to close off all the doors of, of one, or close off all the doors of polytheism. And likewise, similar to that which is supposed to be done is the graves, or any grave that has been raised. Can you do it in this country? No, brothers and sisters. Why? Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the ruler. He was the authorities. So he was able to do that. It's not for the common folk out here to go out reaping havoc amongst society by going to a graveyard and cutting it down or cutting down a raised dome. It's not for any of you to do that. You are not the authorities, nor are you in, in a jurisdiction where there's a Muslim. And even if you were in a Muslim land, you still can't do it. You have to go to the proper channels and go to the authorities and tell them. And they will handle it after that. So everything is done with a what? What a type of protocol, brothers and sisters. Our religion is not a religion of havoc and chaos. Even if you are still in a Muslim country under a Muslim jurisdiction, you still have to tell the authorities. You cannot take these affairs into your own hands. However, the Messenger of Allah Wasallam sent Ali to level off because he was the what? The authorities. And Ali was part of the delegate of the authorities. So he could carry out the orders. So these type of sunan or these different types of practices that keeps... The affair of Tawheed protected and maintained will not be transgressed from the Muslim ruler and the authorities. So our religion is a religion of what? Protocol, everyone. It's not chaotic where any person, random person, can just go out and start wreaking havoc upon society. Well, you all seen the Jew one day, let's go out and kill him. Or I've seen the deviant Muslim, let's go out and kill him. He's a Catholic. That, that our religion is not a religion of chaos like this. Is, is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? So and so, so let's go tell. Let, let's go and cut the hand off the person who stole. We we'll take him in the back under this under the masjid, and let's cut his hand off. And if not, we'll 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 whip him and lash him under the masjid. All this other nonsense that I've heard Muslims do, due to the severe magnitude of their ignorance or the height of their ignorance, not realizing that yeah, these are for the jurisdiction of the ruler, the, the authorities. That if you were in a Muslim country under the authority, this is from their legislative matters that's in their hands. Not for the common folk. Is it clear, everyone? Okay. Five. The message of Allah Sallallahu said, Oh Allah, do not make my grave an idol worshipped. Five. Does the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi made this dua? And we know in the way we discussed last class, the dua of the message of Allah was answered. The message of Allah was answered where his grave became protected with all those walls that are secure around it. First of all, he died in the house of Aisha. 
That was the main re that was the you can see the hikmah of why Allah Ta'ala the Allah what? Allah the Messenger of Allah to die inside of the structure of Aisha. In order for his what? His grave to be protected. To protect it from polytheism. So people won't start worshiping his grave. And start going to his grave and start taking the dirt and rubbing it with themselves and rubbing it with them and trying to get better kept from the dirt and rubbing their bodies on the dirt and rubbing their body. All this nonsense that you'll find, you'll see Muslims doing it. And all of it is polytheism. Especially trying to see Bella Cap by the grave and rubbing dirt. Oh, message of Allah, get my wife pregnant. Oh, message of Allah, relieve from me all my difficulties and my adversity in my life. Ehi, that, and that supplication in itself, you think it's funny, but it happens. It happens every day. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave you tawfiq to teach you tawheed here. So you'll know that that type of nonsense is false. But you'll find that there's a lot of Muslims that do that. And you'll see them doing it. And you'll see them rubbing up against themselves and evil women taking themselves and rubbing up them against the walls and trying to get to the grave. And they can't get to it. But alhamdulillah, they can't get to it. For any rate, ya ma'ash al-ikhwa. So this is what we're talking about. Now, as far as in regards to those who worship Allah, uh, worship the Prophet ﷺ from afar, who makes, it, makes his grave or makes it like a, 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 a so-called uh, idol, that is not due to the message of Allah ﷺ grave not being protected, it's been secured. In this regard, it's been raised secure. As far as the walls around it, protecting it. But that does not pre prevent that there will be other people that still will fall into polytheism, associating the message of Allah, associating their partners with Allah by worshiping Him from afar. Which does happen. Right, right or wrong, everyone? Jayin. Tayyip. This is where we'll stop at because we've got to pray in three more minutes. It says that the wrath of Allah became severe upon a people. <laughs> that the wrath and anger of Allah became severe upon the people who took the grave of their prophets as masajid. This is where I stopped that last class. This is where we're going to stop at right now. <clears throat> There's something else that Minhaji wanted to talk about. Well, I'll talk about that later. But at any rate, I told the brothers and sisters this last time. Last class is where we stopped at. The wrath of Allah. Notice it says in the hadith of your book, غضب الله. الآن صار ذهرك شارد. أنت مركز على الموضوع الذي تحدثنا عنه قبل قليل. أنت الآن تركز عليه. أقوى بعد الدرس. ليس الآن. هذا ليس وقته. راك بعد الدرس. So what we say, we talked about the wrath of Allah, the anger of Allah. We talked about this last class. We said that this characteristic has been affirmed in this hadith in your books. It's in there. Does the wrath of Allah, the anger of Allah, does that mean Allah's retribution or Allah? Sins is a punishment, or does it, just, it doesn't truly mean their anger of Allah? Or do we establish the effect as a result of his anger, which is the punishment? Or do we affirm both? <laughs> first things first. We know that the characteristics of Allah break down to two categories. The first category is the characteristic of Allah's essence. Allah to be with Ta'ala's essence, which is what everyone? Sifat to that, the characteristics of Allah's essence, where you will go and say, you will say, we could even give you examples of this. We can say, for example, the aboveness of Allah, the loftiness of Allah, meaning Allah being above the creation. The characteristic of Allah's loftiness or aboveness or highness is a characteristic of his essence. It never goes away from Allah. Allah is always above the creation. That is a characteristic of Allah's essence. That never goes away from Allah. Allah is always and will continue to be above the creation. That's a part of his excuse me, legally part. I want to say part. That is from Allah's that is from his essence to go ta'ala. His essence and his characteristic, Allah is always above. Sifat al-ulu, sifat to that Characteristic of Allah's highness is a characteristic of his essence. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he comes on the day of resurrection, he will be above the creation still. 
The law will still be above the creation when he judges between all the creation and mankind. He will still be above the creation. Because he will still be above the outsh. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? He'll be above the cre creation. Because the message of Allah is said, the hadith, which is the Sahihain, he said, I will come to the throne of Allah and I will prostrate under it. So it says, I will prostrate under the arsh of Allah. Also, the sun. I don't want to talk about that right now. But at any rate, for in regards to what? Sifa to that of Allah. For example, Allah is above His highness, highness, loftiness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From His essence is His awareness, knowledge, wisdom, highness, ability. Life, what he intends or what he wants, or what, he, what does he translate, what he intends or what he wants, it's also a core part of his characteristics of his essence. Also Allah's sight, his hearing, is all part of his essence. It's not an action, it's his essence. Because Allah constantly sees everything. Allah hears everything. Allah always has knowledge of everything. Allah is fully aware of everything. And Allah is wise, in, is wise constantly. And Allah has knowledge and he's always above. That is a characteristic of his essence. And there's more than that, of course. Let's not just restrict it to those characteristics. I'll just give you examples. Is there any time, is it correct to say that Allah hears if he wills? Is that correct to say that? Allah sees if he wills? Is that correct? Wrong. You cannot say Allah sees if he wills. That means there's a time that Allah stops seeing. And there's a time where Allah stops hearing. Which is incorrect. Type. The second category of Allah's characteristics is called sifat al-af'al. Characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions. From those actions is what's mentioned in this hadith here. Such as ghadab, Allah's wrath, his anger, or what Allah hates. That is a characteristic of Allah's actions. Write it down. That is a characteristic. I'm sorry. Let me throw it at you. That's a characteristic of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions. Is this ghadab, sakhat, kalaha, rida. Mahabba, love, Rahma, him being pleased, mercy, anger, wrath, and what Allah hates, are from sifat of Al, is from the characteristics of his actions. Sifat al Afal, 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 Jamiru Fi'l, is from the characteristic of his actions. Is it correct to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves if he wills? Is that correct? He loves if he wills. If he wills, he loves. Ta'if, from the characteristics of Allah's actions is his anger. It's written in your books. Ta'if, from the characteristics of Allah's actions, dissension. Dissension. Ascension. To grab. To take, yes, it's from his actions. Taib, to come on the day of resurrection. And when you come, Maji is also characteristic of his actions. Ascension, descension. Taib, is it correct to say Allah descends when he wills? Is it correct? Huh? That's correct. That is correct. Nazala idha sha. Wa kayfa sha. Idha sha. Mata sha. Wa kayfa sha. Just write it down. Keep the focus. Is it clear what I'm saying? Allah descends if He wills, how He wills, when He wills, if He wills. 
That's correct. Allah will come on the day of resurrection. If he wills, how he wills, when he wills, and when, oh, that's a one already. And how he wills, and when he wills, if he wills. That's correct. Notice that everything I said, if he wills, then say that shows that there was a time when it was done. Ah, yes. If Allah, the actions of Allah, to be with the Allah, Lahu Huduth, Tahtuthu Fi Waqt, Duna Waqt, happens from one time to the next. Yes. What is the delil for that? The delil for that is in the book of Allah. Starting from the book of Allah. That the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially his speech, also has huduth. We'll talk about that. As far as his speech, that's a, that shares between both categories. That and fail. Action and his essence. So we'll talk about that right now. But at any rate, the, uh, the, the actions of Allah, you'll find, happens from one time to the next. Yes. Allah does it when he, when he wills. When he wills. How he wills, if he wills, and a manner he wills. You'll find that, the, for example, the descension of Allah, Allah Taala informed us that he descends every single night at a specific time. It happens every night. The Prophet ﷺ made it clear. He said, Fi The third part of the night, that's a time. And in that particular time, the ibad is supposed to what? Put forth of worship even more. Hoping that Allah will be, or that is the time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer the what? Supplication. So why do you now look forward to that specific time? Because you know that that's when it what? It happened. Is it clear what I'm saying? Jay, from those actions of Allah to be with the Allah is anger, wrath, hate, love, Mercy and being pleased. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? Five. We'll stop here. We'll talk to him about this next class, Sunday. I have more to this, more to add to this. Now, this is a poetry. وكل ما جاء في الوحيين من صفة لله نثبتها والنص نعتمد صفات ذات وأفعال نمر ولا نقول كيف ولا ننفي كمن جحد لكن على ما يليق على ما يليق كما على ما أراده الله يليق كما أراده عناه الله نعتقد وفي وفي الشهادة علم القلب مشترط يقينه قد قبول ليس يفتقد إخلاصك الصدق فيها مع محبتها كذا الولا والبرا فيها لها عمد فيه توالي للتقوى وتنصرهم وكل أعدائه إن لهم العدو الله أكبر جي anyway says with كل ما جاء في الوحيين من صفة لله نثبتها والنص نعتمد صفات ذات وأفعال نمر ولا نقول كيف ولا ننفي كمن جحد لكن على just stop here you, you see you understand we'll talk about this later any questions about the lesson تفضل عبد الله because we gotta pray غضب الله the anger of Allah تفضل أحمد Characteristic of Allah's essence. Tafadha. Hmm. <coughs> well, as far as a Masihi, you'll find that Ahl-Ilm say you shouldn't call a person Masihi, a Christian's Masihi. You should call him Nasrani. 
That's what they say. The majority of them are all rough. And even when I, I found some kalam Sheikh uh, Abdul Aziz bin Baz, we said not all the Shia these days all have the ideologies of rough. If not all of them have some type of rough with them. Even though they call themselves so Shia. Shia of Ali, the followers of Ali. Because that's what Shia means. Shia means. Shia, well, also the word Shia means to, like to follow, means tabi. Means like a tabi. Like a person that you know, you know, Shia'i'uhu, he's like to follow whatever, the Shia of Ali. But it's all, it's all hypocrisies. That's what they proclaim, what they manifest to get followers. But it's, it's nonsense. But you'll find, I'm fine, I gotta find the kalam of Ahl uh, that they say the majority, if not all, the Shia have rofa with them now. All of them, without any exception. The one who killed Umar. The one who killed Umar, they have a statue of him, they claim. The one who killed Umar. <sighs> They're the origin of every atrocity taking place in this dunya right now. <sighs> they say that now they have politics, they have, uh, they have missiles aimed at Mecca right now. That's what they said. They said they have missiles waiting pointed at Mecca right now. They already shot a missile at Mecca already. They intercepted it. Iran, but nobody talks about Iran. Nobody. Shh. Nobody. They did the most, done the most despicable, most filthiest things across history. And nobody says anything. Y'all, everyone talks about the, the, most, the rulers of Saudi Arabia. Oh, hypocrites. Echi, have you read the, the, the history of the, of the Rawatha? You, you, echi, you, it'll probably make you throw up maybe 20 times straight and over. The origin of the Mongolians when they were terrorizing, destroying nations. You know who opened the door for them to come into countries and kill mil millions and millions of Muslims? The Shia. They opened the door. Walked told them to come right in. They dismantled the Muslims of what they had of manpower. What happened with uh, Tulsi, who was a Shia. He, dis he, came, he got close to the, khila the Khalifa. Got close to him. Dismantled the, the, the army. Say, oh, well, you don't need these armies anymore. He's just taking up your money. That's what he told them. Because he was an advisor for the, for the Khalifa at the time. Oh, no, you're going to have too much money. You're spending on all these armies. You need to dismantle them so you can have a lot more money left. He, the, the Khalifa did it. All along, he's planning for the Mongolians to come in and, and destroy the country. He was all in cahoots. He went back to the Mongolians. I'll dismantle the army. Once I do that, you guys come in. But nobody says nothing about Iran. Huh? Absolutely. Same thing. Same thing was going on today. Same exact thing. These people sent ballistic missiles over the border from Yemen and all in Riyal to the end of it. The, one of the missiles landed in the country. That's an act of war. That's an act of war. The missile landed in the country. That's, like I said, that's an example. Like, for example, somebody shooting a missile from Mexico over. Can you imagine Mexico sound, sent a, a ballistic missile over America and, and landed in America? What would be going on right now? That's an act of war. And they have done it more than once. And like I said, the Wali al Amr, from, from, that you'll find that the majority of the rulers are just keep taking it on the chin. All because they know what's going, they know, they're looking at the whole size and up the whole what's going to be the domino effect of how it's going to affect the world of millions of people that's going to be involved if they was to attack and start a war back with them. So they just take the hit on the, on the chin every day just to keep the peace. But everybody talks bad about Saudi. But not one word against the, not against the Shia and the Iran. And they're the most despicable and filthiest I've, I've seen. To this day, from the time of old up to today, it hasn't changed. And then you have dumb, gullible, Ikhwani Muslims that really want to join with these people. And I think you even told me a master that they, <laughs> that they really, really want to join with these people. It's, it's clear to show how ignorant the Muslims, Muslims really don't read. They don't read history. Actually, when has there ever been a time when the Shia have done good for Ahl Sunnah or for the Muslims in general? When? Give me one. 
you even find Sheikh Hussain mentioned in Hajj Sunnah, he said, if there was ever a war with the Muslims, he said, you'll find that they were joining with the enemy in order for what? In order for the Muslims to be killed. They'll even join with the people of Kufr from the Jews and the Christians. They'll join with them and align, and align with them. Eventually. Don't be deceived by the news, even though they say that some of the Muslims they're shooting at Israel, that they said, we'll fight Muslims. That's all politics and nonsense. Trust me, that's a smokescreen. If they had the chance, they would come together with them. If it was to destroy the Muslims, they will become allies with them. As has been done in history all before. What happened with the Tartars, the Mongolians, when they opened up the country for them to destroy and ravage and pillage and pillage and destroy millions and millions and millions of Muslims. So they said that in, in Tariq and history, that blood, it was so, so much uh, uh, mass hysteria and pillage and carnage and killing and murder, they even the river started turning red. And all and he said it was mixed with ink too, because he was destroying all the all the sources of knowledge that was built of hadith and everything. He was destroying it. And you know who opened the door up and said, Welcome? The Rawfilt. Iranians. <laughs> you can't argue with the facts. You can argue with your feelings back and forth, but we don't care about feelings. Give us the facts. This is what the facts show. You have never been trustworthy until they have a whole book called the Khianat al Rawafat. I have it. It's called the, the Treason or the Treachery of the Rawafat Abra Tariq across the across the, the uh, across history. But no for the Muslims for the common folk when they watch and they so called their TV, man, Saudi Arabia makes me sick. I can't stand those Munafiqeen. You should be called those Iranians, those Iranians, of what they've been doing. This was you you need to be talking about. May Allah smell down to protect the king of Saudi Arabia from those people. طيب هذا هو صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه. سبحانك اللهم بحمدك وشهد لا إله إلا أنت استغفرك وتوبيلك.